Mark here for Mark 2.0, Gordon's in Ontario, Canada. And our next guest, our next iconic guest is the pastor <laughs> of Calvary Bible College. You also Church. remember him, Calvary Bible Church, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you remember him from iconic movies like The Invisible Kid, Not Quite oh, Human, gosh, man. The Boy Who Could Fly, first. The Lord Protector, <laughs> Uncle Buck, and several other films. Jay Underwood, welcome to the podcast. We really great to be here, gang. On. Good, good to see you, Mark. Good to see you, Gordon. Happy to be here. Great for you to be here. And it was predestined. It was going to happen. <laughs> That's right. Before the foundation of the world, I'm sure of it. <laughs> uh, Want to hear about your journey? I mean, you, st you, you're a kid growing up in San Francisco. You went to acting school. You got into the movies, and now, you know, you're, you're pastoring a church. You heard God's <laughs> calling. It's like, this, this is a fascinating, yeah, this is a fascinating journey. So just walk us through uh, your, your, <laughs> life, your life travels. Yeah, how long do we have? A snapshot. Uh, sure, I'll, tr I'll try to give you, I'll try to nutshell it as best I can. Yeah, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, Hayward, East Bay. Uh, got involved in, in in acting at an early age, just loved doing puppet shows and magic shows for kids in the neighborhood, that kind of thing. Took theater classes, you know, did church plays, school plays, community theater plays, started getting other plays, different parts of the Bay Area, ended up at uh, the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco as a youth, um, taking classes and doing, I did one, a, a Christmas carol there one year, <clears throat> got hooked up through them with a, a place in Minneapolis called the Children's Theater Company of Minneapolis. It's kind of a world-renowned children's theater. Ended up going to school there for three years. They had a performing arts high school. And so I ended up graduating from high school there. I was doing plays galore while I was there. And uh, all the kids had agents in Minneapolis because Minneapolis at the time, this would be in the uh, 80s, they did a lot of commercials, a lot of industrial films. But every now and again, if there was a, a film company from Hollywood or New York that wanted to find fresh talent, they'd kind of go on one of these little casting searches. And Minneapolis was one of their stops. And so I started getting these auditions and they're for, for you know, good, good, good jobs, good films. And, and, uh, and the first one I did was my very first movie, uh, one called Desert Bloom with John Voight and Joe Beth Williams, Ellen Barkin, Annabeth Gish was the lead. And I played, uh, I played opposite her. And it was her first movie, too, and um, uh, went off and did that, came back to school, got The Boy Who Could Fly next, which was my first leading part, <clears throat> went to Canada, to Vancouver, to uh, shoot that. That's when filmmaking in, in Vancouver was just starting to take off and just, you know, go nuts because uh, they were making it worth uh, worth uh, our while here in the States, you know, for, for being cost effective and having great locations. Did The Boy Who Could Fly. Came back to a uh, home in the Bay Area. I was going to go to NYU to study uh, acting at their uh, Tisch School of the Arts. And instead had these two movies coming out that fall. And uh, a manager got hold of me and said, hey, would you want to consider coming out to Los Angeles and kind of striking while the iron's hot? And I thought, well, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. You know, I'm fine with saying no to school for a while. And so that was 1986. Uh -huh moved down to Los Angeles and just started doing it, you know, and, and got, had, it was easy enough to get an agent at that point. So I had the films under my belt and, and uh, just started getting work. And for the next 20 years, basically made my living as a, as an actor. I, I called myself a blue collar actor. Um, I, I, I worked consistently. I made my living doing it. I didn't need to wait tables or take other jobs, but I, I was, you know, I was kind of one of those in that realm. I wasn't an A-list guy. I was a B-list guy. I mean, but 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 again, a working blue collar working actor ne never quite quite crossed over. Um, so that went on for 20 years. But in that time, <clears throat> I became a believer, became a Christian. And um, and as my faith started growing, I realized that, man, that's going to that's going to affect things. That's going to affect the kinds of parts I go out on and the kinds of roles I want to take. And um, I found I started saying no to more and more auditions. And at one point I thought, 
I just didn't know where it was going to go because either my agents would eventually lose interest because I'm saying no to so much stuff. Or you go, can I really survive in Hollywood and make my living at it? Only taking, you know, G and PG rated, you know, stuff kind of thing. And, uh, and so as this is going on and, and this is now taking place over, you know, several years. And, uh, and then I just, there was one defining moment. I, I just knew that God was calling me into full-time ministry. And, uh, and basically it all happened on one day. The next day I called up my agents and manager and said, I'm done. And they said, yeah, we're not surprised. <laughs> we kind of saw it coming, you know? And, uh, and that was that. And so then I basically, I went to seminary. I knew I just, I wanted to learn the Bible. So I went to the master seminary out here in Los Angeles. John MacArthur's the president of the, the, the seminary, uh, studied there, kept, um, I, I was doing ministry at Calvary Bible church in Burbank. And, uh, I was the junior high pastor while I went to seminary and it was cool because I had a few people that were directors that, uh, would call me up and say, in fact, one friend, he was directing uh, Hallmark movies. And so he called me up. I did a couple of movies while I was uh, while I was still in seminary, you know, because, you know, Hallmark, I, I knew I could uh, I could take the part. It wasn't going to be compromising in any way. And actually between that and commercials, God just allowed me to, to continue to make my living while I was in seminary. And then once I graduated, um, took a church up in the northwest corner of California, in a little town called Weaverville, which is an hour west of Reading. And I was there for 13 years. And then the Lord called us back to Los Angeles. I came back down to Calvary Bible Church to be the adult ministry pastor. And then that was a year and a half ago. Uh, our, our, our main pastor at the time resigned back in October. And I was asked to step in and fill the pulpit. And then they made me the full-time pastor this last Easter time. And then here I am with you guys. <laughs> so that, man, that was, that was pretty good yeah. for the nutshell. I think. Yeah, what kind of commercials more... did you do growing up? Man, you know what? I, I, my commercials were more in the latter part of my career. Okay. And they weren't when I was a kid. And, uh, oh, man, everything from a Jeep commercial to Napa Auto Parts to Chrysler to uh, you, you name it kind of thing. Levi's. Uh, it, was, it was great because... At first, when, when I was first moved to Los Angeles, you know, my manager had big, big plans for me, basically, you know, you're going to be a big time movie actor kind of thing, you know, and, and well, at the time, at the time, this is again, mid 80s, um, movie actors didn't do television, they certainly didn't do commercials, and you kind of had this weird hierarchy. Nowadays, it's all changed, sure. right? Celebrities who are doing movies love to get a series. The people on series love to get movies. Everybody loves to do commercials because they just, you know, it's just money in the bank. Yeah. So I had to kind of get over some, some mindset stuff that was just kind of killing me for a while in the commercial realm because I thought, ah, I'm too good for this. I don't, what do I need commercials for? You know, I was just bogus. And once I finally accepted it, mm. oh man, they're awesome because again, you could just make, you could make bank, you know? Sure. I mean, even while I was in seminary, between my commercials and those couple of Hallmark films, four years of seminary basically paid my, uh, I, I didn't have to worry. I mean, I had a wife and kids, mortgage, all that stuff. Yeah. And, um, you know, if I could shoot five commercials in a year, it would, it would carry me for the year. And when you were young acting, you weren't only uh, doing films in L.A. because Not Quite Human was in Scottsdale, right? So I was based out of Los Angeles. Exactly. Yeah, and I would say that probably... 80% of my work and my career was on location. So yeah, exactly. As I spent, we did the, we did not quite human one in Scottsdale, not quite human two, more around the Tempe area. Um, Desert Bloom, I shot in uh, Tucson. Uh, so I spent a lot of time in Arizona as well, because that's where you're at, right, Mark? Yeah, over there yeah. in Phoenix. Yeah, exactly. Not quite human three, we went to Vancouver. So we went up north for, uh, for that one, yeah. Wow. Well, you're at an interesting age, you know, being 53, 54 years of age. It's almost like you have a foot in two different camps. You just <laughs> enumerated a number of guys like John Voight and yeah. Ellen Barkin and, and, you know, of course, John Candy. Yeah. Who our younger listeners and our younger viewers will go, oh, th th those, those guys are all ancient. They don't even know who these people are, Gordon, half the time. It kills me. <laughs> yeah. 
you know, the, you know John Voight, who's John Voight? Well, here's who's the funny thing. So, so when I booked Desert Bloom, and uh, I was in Minneapolis at the time going to school, and, uh, and my agent uh, called me, she said, you got the part in that movie Desert Bloom. I'm like, it was like two months after I had auditioned for it. I'd totally forgotten about it. She says, you're working with Academy Award winner, John Voight. I'm like, what did he win an Academy Award for? She's like, coming home. How do you not know this? And I go, no, but here's what's cool. Joe Beth Williams, the mom and poltergeist, man. She's in the movie, you know? And I thought that was really cool. <laughs> I forgot about that role, poltergeist. I forgot about her in that movie. But you're exactly right. It just shows you how each generation, right, looks back and, and, and you know, yeah. And I, so, yeah, a lot of my, the people that I worked with in the 80s and 90s, people have already forgotten some of them. You know, it's sad to say. Yeah. Well, you also touched on the fact that, you know, the division within the acting profession, how, you know, television and movies, generally speaking, you know, no... I remember hearing an interview with Michael Lang, Lang, Langdon. He wanted to get into film and they said, no, no, no one's going to pay to see you. Right. They can watch you riding a horse every week on Bonanza or, yeah. you know, living in Walnut Grove. No one's yeah. going to pay to see you in a movie. And now everything is, you know, yeah, whatever it's just, platform, mm -hmm. it's wide open. But the when you and I were growing up, because we're pretty much the same age, yeah. when we were growing up, we knew who Burt Parks was. We knew who Gene Kelly was. We knew who Fred Astaire was. We knew George yeah. Burns, Grace Allen. We knew those names, the big yeah. stars. Now, right. kids don't know those yeah. younger actors. When you're up in the pulpit now, how often do people want to talk to you about your acting career? Yeah, it's, it, it's interesting. Certainly... As, as time goes on and and I lose my hair, you know, stuff like that, I'm not as recognizable you know, as, as I was at other times. So so the amount of times that, like, say I'm recognized is is pretty, pretty few and far between. But, you know, there's those people out there that are your autograph hounds and stuff like that. And they they can find anyone anywhere. And I when I first started at Calvary, even I remember having a couple of people show up after one Sunday and somebody brought these these two fellas my way and said, hey, yeah, they wanted to meet you. And they start whipping out comics because I'd done the Fantastic Four, the, the yeah. Roger yes, Corman yeah. version. You know, and they start pulling out all this pair of and want me to sign it all. And, and people are kind of looking on like, they want you to sign all this? I'm like, yeah, yeah, it, it happens, you know. Or I'll get I'll get stuff in the mail still, you know, some some fan mail here and there for, you know, people that can kind of track you down and, and care. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Well, another thing you brought up uh, during your, your bio, you said you, be, uh, I don't remember exactly the turn of phrase you used. You found the Lord or you became a Christian. Yeah. Take us on your faith journey. Did you grow up in the church or outside of the church? Yeah, I was one of those kids that, uh, no, I grew up going to church. We went to a Presbyterian church in Hayward, um, faithfully every week, and I uh, was involved in youth group and, you know, all of that. Uh, and then, and then when I went away to school in Minneapolis, looking back on my life, I realized, looking back, I was not a, a true believer. You know, I, I had gone to church and I liked it and was interested and had a lot of head knowledge, but it hadn't gone into my into my heart. And uh, because once I was in Minneapolis, I just could care less if I went to church. You know, I'd come home and to see my family, we go to church, and it was that was fine. And and then I moved out to Los Angeles, same thing. I just had no kind of desire for, um, for church. The change was actually working on Not Quite Human 2 when we were in Tempe, Arizona. And I had this uh, co-star who was uh, playing uh, like my, my, my pal in the movie. And um, we're at lunch one day and he was just a real outgoing, kind of in your face, real forward guy, you know. And uh, so we're sitting there at lunch one day and he goes, so you Christian? I was like, whoa, sure, dude, keep, keep it quiet, you know, it's not like something you just talk about out here in public, you know, in the restaurant, right, and, uh, and I said, well, 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 yeah, yeah, I grew up going to church, and, you know, and, and um, but he got me thinking, well, wait a minute, am I, what am I, am I, <laughs> I, I don't know, in any case, he invited me to church when we got back to Los Angeles, 
So I started going to church with them. And um, I, it turns out, looking back again, I realized I still wasn't truly saved at that point. It kind of began a new journey. It wasn't until um, I, I met my wife, we got engaged, and I got on one of these kind of church kicks again, like, like, you know, we, we should find a church. And so I took her to this church that my friend had taken me to. It turns out it was a pretty charismatic church, you know. It was, you know, speaking in tongues and just a lot of craziness. And I didn't know this, that from anything else, you know. And, and she's like, she said afterwards, she didn't tell me this right away, but she was thinking, oh, my Lord, my fiance is involved in a cult, you know. And, and just thought it was, she said, uh, I don't mind if we go to church, but do you think we can find somewhere else that, you know, we both both might just kind of like, I said, well, yeah, yeah, sure. So a few years go by, she gets pregnant and I kind of get on the church kick again because I'm like, oh man, we're going to have a baby. I, we got to find a church now. We, that's where you raise your kids. It's family. It's good morals, those things, you know? So we started, started looking all around and, and, um, and that's just when we ended up at Calvary Bible Church. I happened to go there for a Sunday and she had morning sickness and didn't want to go. And so I went and, uh, and I just saw kids, families everywhere. And I'm like, this is it because it's family. And so we started going and about two years into the going, we both, uh, they have this drama production called Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames. And, and it's just a gospel presentation, you know, it does, they do it through drama. And we're both sitting there at the end of it, like, that's, that's me. I, I'm, I'm not convinced that I would be going to heaven. If I died right now, I am not convinced that that is where I would be going. And she felt the same. We prayed just, Lord, please forgive us for our sins. And we do believe and trust in Jesus Christ as our savior. And, and that was then just kind of the beginning of, of our spiritual life. Well, uh, I'm trying to remember the guest we had on because we've had a number of Christian actors, sure. professing Christian actors, yeah. which I love yeah. because you, you nailed it so well when you said, you know, the in, in your face fellow actor, yeah. you know, said, so are you a Christian? He's like, shh. <laughs> and so we don't proclaim that loudly. We do that's my Sunday yeah. thing. I keep that to myself. Right. And, and uh, what's so, it like? Well, well here's something cool. Here's something cool about that. So, so fast forward then to when now I know that God's calling me into full time ministry. I'm going to seminary here in Los Angeles, and I kept doing commercials, you know, as we said, to pay the bills. Yes. So at this point, I'm totally outward about my faith. I don't, I'm not thinking, oh, this is, this might hurt my career or, because that's, that's the thing. I mean, as you can see, and what you hear in the news stuff, Hollywood is just, man, they are very much against, they're against a lot of things, but they, they're, they're pretty against Christians. And, um, and so it's, it's not that there's not Christians out there in the industry. There's, there's plenty, but they just tend to stay at thing, keep things a little on the quieter side. So me, I don't care. So I, I remember going to a, a, I got cast in a, a, a commercial. And so I show up on the set and um, we're filming and, and I had a stack of books from seminary that I had to read, you know, so I have those because on sets, it's hurry up and wait, as you probably know, Mark. And, and, uh, and so I got my stack of books, I'm reading my books. And at lunchtime, the camera assistant, the guy who's pulling focus on the camera, walks up to me, motions, like, can I talk to you? And kind of pulls me aside away from the group. And he says, real kind of quiet, hush, hush. He goes, now, I, I saw you with the stack of books. And I noticed that several of them said that the author was John MacArthur. Is that John MacArthur who's on the radio? John MacArthur, pastor, preacher? And I go, yeah. And he goes, are you a Christian? And I go, yeah. He grabs my hand, starts pumping it up and down. And he goes, me too, me too, you know? And he was, he was so excited to meet another brother in the Lord on a, on a commercial set. But again, you could tell everything was hush, hush, like, you know, and, and I started thinking to myself, okay, that was very interesting. There's got to be other Christians in the industry. And then I kind of made it a, a mission to kind of figure out who the Christians were, if there were Christian groups that were Hollywood actor people or whatever, you know, because I thought if this guy's out there and he's dying to meet somebody else on a set that's a Christian, there's got to be others, you know. And sure enough, I started doing some digging and there are, there's all kinds of Christians that just tend to be a little more subdued about things, sure. you know. 
How bad is it? I mean, you know, I, I remember here, here's another old name that you'll know, and I'm and I may not even remember the man's name correctly. I think it's Fred Mc, uh, the guy who used to play in the Shaggy DA on Disney films. Yeah, Fred McMurray. Fred McMurray, him? okay. Yeah. And his career, he was doing Disney films and was, you know, what similar to yourself. You know, I, I call him a B plus. Yeah. I, I don't consider you a B actor. I consider you a B a B plus actor. Okay, I'll take and, it. <laughs> you know, a B plus is someone who, if they, you know, there's so much, I, I don't like to say random, but you know, you need to have that vehicle that blows you up into something huge. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and the talent can be there. But if you don't get that vehicle, yeah. But the question I was going to ask you, going back to other Christian actors, is we interviewed, I believe it was Cameron Arnett, and he talked about the fact that he talks about his salvation, and then he talks about his conversion as though they're two separate events. Mm. You know, I got saved, but I wasn't converted. Mm. Because anyone can say the sinner's prayer, but there's a lot more to faith than just laying it down at the at the feet of the cross and saying, you know, here are my sins. Yeah. Thank you, I mean, Jesus, for, for washing them away. Uh -huh. you, we've got then the, then you got sixty six books to go through. Yeah, I, I would say to me, conversion and salvation are 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 the, are the same thing, um, but but. Uh, but I think, I, if I remember too, you'd ask just kind of like about just how it is for Christians in the industry yes. right now. I think, I think what, you, what we're seeing is it's not just Christians too, but anyone that claims to be a conservative, first of all, in Hollywood is just being lambasted. The, 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 one of the prime examples was Gina Carano on the, um, on the, um, yeah. on the, uh, the Mandalorian. Mandalorian. Yeah. You know, who basically it was OK for a Mandalorian guy to uh, be kind of out out public about his political viewpoints. But the minute yeah. she was, then she gets fired, literally fired. And um, and so I think that was very telling. And um, typically what you will see from many Christians is that they tend to be more on the conservative you know, Bible believing Christians, well, there's no really other kind of Christian, the Bible believing one, but, but, you know, tend to be a little more conservative in nature. And, uh, and so, so yeah, I think, um, I think it's one of those things that right now, especially with the LGBTQ stuff that's going on, it's, um, it becomes very difficult for, for Christians in the industry. One, so one of the things I started at our church and I'd actually done this before I went up to the, the church in uh, Northern California. But once I got back here, we jumped right in is I have a fellowship group called Cast and Crew. And so it's for anyone in our church that's in the industry, in the entertainment industry. So we have actors, we have animators, we have editors, we have, you know, people that drive, you know, vans, costume. on co whatever, exactly. And it's just a time and a place for people to come together and just basically share. So what's going on out there? What have you experienced? What, what kind of persecution have you, have you had? How can we be praying for each other? How can we encourage each other? You know, what's the Bible say about standing firm in your faith? And, you know, even in the midst of, of this, uh, I mean, I think then you have other people like Kirk Cameron that became very uh, outward about their faith. And even Chris Pratt, you know, man, he's taken yeah. some heat. Oh, that's right. You know, he took some heat for for being with a, a church in Los Angeles, and it's probably not the most conservative church out there. But man, he he he's taken some flack, you know. And uh, Kirk Cameron went the other route, and he kind of went more into ministry, and then kind of found a, a his own kind of hybrid of still being able to make films or or documentaries and doing the stuff that he did with uh, Way of the Master and and uh, yes. Ray Comfort and. And, um, you know, so he kind of he kind of has his one foot in it, but really one foot out of it. But I think uh, I think he he's taken heat, you know, as well. And have you met Kirk Cameron long time ago? Not as a Christian. Oh, I remember God. auditioning for uh, 
for a new series that he was doing and he was in the audition and he came to my school my seminary one day he was invited to our apologetics and evangelism class because he was doing all the stuff with Ray Comfort the way the master um, documentaries and uh, it just happens that I wasn't there that day I didn't have class that day so so I missed it I miss seeing him but I mean I, I I think he's terrific I think what he's doing is is just awesome and you know praise God for him I mean what you, you're seeing a lot of changes right in Christian filmmaking too I mean that's yes. that's become a whole other whole other can of worms and the, I think we owe a lot to the Kendrick brothers for what they did to yeah. open it up you know mm-hmm. with with a flywheel but then facing the giants and and courageous and and all the films that they've done because War Hollywood room, saw that Hummer. yeah exactly Hollywood this is what they care about and they saw oh my word these guys are making movies for a million dollars now two five million dollars but they're making 10 15 20 you know we got to get a we got to get a, a part of this and so you, you saw the studios start coming out with all their faith-based arms so you got Fox Faith and you have Sony has their their um yes. faith-based you know, side of things because they realize there's money to be made. Well, that 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 is a fascinating movie. We've talked about it on the podcast before. Uh, Facing the Giants is mm-hmm. one of my favorite movies, and I love it because it's almost like a high school or a community <clears throat> theater production. People go to community right. theater and they're paying ten bucks, and they think, okay, how bad is this going to be? <laughs> right. And then so often, because the expectations are so low, because yeah. it's community theater, they go, wow, that was that was incredible. Yeah. And it was made for $100,000, that movie. <clears throat> yep. No professional actors. Right. And you talked about the improvement in the quality of Christian films, where totally. Christians used to watch a movie going, please don't let this be too horrible. Yeah. And now they have the production values and everything. Yeah. Have you thought about, you know, the Irwin brothers, the Kendrick brothers? Yeah. Have you thought about branching into that? Have you, you had offers? Yeah, here, so here was my kind of deal with Christian filmmaking. So I got, when I was still down here in Hollywood doing it, I ended up doing it one of the last films for uh, Billy Graham's company. When they when they still had their, um, um, oh gosh, what was the name of their uh, their film uh, film. Uh, uh, group I'll, I'll think of it in any case they were um so i did i did one it was myself and um pat hingle uh who you know great old character actor uh was uh one of the one of the leads in it as well and um it was still they were really trying hard to have good stories that and we filmed it with with i mean they went through regular agents you know to find the actors and half our crew was christians and half were not um, they they up the production value, but it still kind of had that kind of little stilted of okay, oh, here's the gospel presentation part, and we get to the gospel presentation, okay, and now we can go back to the movie kind of thing, you know. It it it, it still had a little bit of that, you know, and um, yes. and then once I moved to Weaverville and I was pastoring the church, there was a film company down here that sent me a script, asked me if I would be a part of it, and it was called No Greater Love. And it, it was kind of in the vein of um, Courageous, uh, the Kendrick Brothers, the one about marriage. Yes. No, Fireproof. Sorry, Fireproof. Mm, okay. And, okay. Uh, and, it, and, it, and it was, and it, it kind of focused on a biblical view of marriage. And, um, and I did that. And, and the movie came out great. It really came out well. And, and, you know, kind of played in the Christian circles and DVD and all that stuff. And then, um, but I was pastoring at the time. And so I, 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 I'm pastoring full time, you know, it's how I make my, my living too. And, and so I can't just stop and take, you know, two months to go and, and film a movie kind of thing. So what did happen was because of that film and meeting some of the people that I did, one of the producers then ended up becoming the, the um, overseer for the cinema department at not the master's seminary where I went, but the master's university. So John MacArthur has a, a, a college, the, the Master's University, and my friend uh, uh, took over the uh, film department. So what he liked to do is while he is giving the kids, his students, you know, um, practical experience in making movies, then he would kind of fill out the cast and crew with working professionals. 
So there'd be some student actors, but there would be other actors like myself that would step in and play parts. And he had some crew people that were the kids, but other crew members, you know, were working professionals. And so they were the, the, the students all had the, the uh, experience of working alongside professional people. And it just really enhanced, I think, their experience and taught them a lot. So basically, I've been doing that for like, I don't know, six or seven years, eight years, something like that. So every now and again, he calls me up and says, hey, you want to come do a do one of our student films? And so that's kind of how I've how I've uh, <laughs> kind of kept my 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 toe, my toe in it. Well, I'm just curious during your acting career when you're in, a, you know, Uncle Buck and, and uh, you know, all the rest. Yeah. When was the who was the biggest star where you walked onto a uh, onto a set, or when you got a part and found out, oh my, I'm working with you've got to be kidding. Wh 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 where you were more of a yeah. fan than yeah. a colleague. Yeah. Um, when I did okay, when I did the boy who could fly, they had this great supporting cast. So they had Fred Gwynn who played Herman Munster on the Munsters. Yeah. He played my uncle. So I'm like, oh wow. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Colleen Dewhurst was in it, and I knew who she was. She was big time. Bonnie Bedelia, Louise Fletcher from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Nurse mm. Ratchet, played a oh, psychiatrist God. in the movie, which was kind of a fun casting thing. So uh, here I am, this young 16 year old actor, and I have some of the powerhouses of, you know, the, the generation two before me. And, and it wasn't lost on me. So I, I thought that was pretty cool. But the one you mentioned, in terms of me being a fan, Uncle Buck, hands down. I mean, when I when my agent called me up and they said, so we got you this audition for the next John Hughes movie, first of all. So I'm a huge John Hughes fan. I mean, you know, 16 Candles, yeah. Breakfast Club, yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. And, and Brad, it's a John yeah. Candy movie. And I'm like, are you kidding me? So here was the catch, though. The catch was, was that the part originally of Bug that I played in the movie was written as a punk rocker. And I thought when back in the day, you look at my stuff like not quite human. And I was sure. always cast as the all American nice guy next door. I was not going to be seen as some punk rocker. You know, I happened to have long hair, longer hair at the time. And um, so I went to this friend of mine that was uh, working out here uh, in, in, um, in the entertainment industry who used to be a punk rocker and still had a lot of his, his clothing and stuff. I said, Kurt, you gotta, I'm auditioning for this punk rocker for John Hughes. You gotta give me clothes or necklace or whatever. He's like, dude, I got you covered. And I went to a friend of mine who's a makeup artist. And I said, what can we do? She goes, I got you covered. So she did up, did makeup, hair, kind of made me looking like Sid Vicious, you know, and, and, yes. uh, and I had all the, the paraphernalia and, and the clothing. And I thought, okay, when I go into this audition, I can't be Jay and look the part I have to, from the time I walk into the office, I have to be bug. I, I just, mm -hmm. I have to, I have to act it. I can't, I can't try to be nice guy, Jay, with all the garb on. I said, I just thought it's just not going to work. So I did. And the first audition was just, they put me on videotape, you know, so it's just the casting director and they put yeah. me on videotape. But even with the casting director, I just, I had the, my, my, my speech and just everything and my attitude. It was just all there. I just didn't let up from the time I walked into the office to the moment I left. So I get a call back. And they said, for the callback, it's going to be with John Hughes and John Candy. I'm like, ah! <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> can't wait. And so, so I, I, I got my, my friend's clothes again. I went back to my friend, do my hair and makeup again, you know, and, and I show up at the office and same thing. I thought from the time I walk in, I can't let up. So, you know, I get come into the office and they're stinking John Hughes and John Candy, you know, it was just them. That was it. I don't even remember that there was a casting director. It was just, I was like. <laughs> And you're dying inside, right? You're just dying, but I got to play the part. So I'm just, I'm just like, you know, yeah, what's up? Yeah, dude. And I had this necklace on that had like a jaw of an animal, like it was a real jawbone of an animal, you know? And Candy's like, well, what, what, uh, that's, uh, what, what's that necklace you got on there? That's, that's, uh, that's kind of interesting. I said, yeah, man, it's like the jaw of a rat, dude, you know? It's like, oh, that's, that's, that's really, I'm like, yeah, whatever, you know? Just playing that up and, and did the reading. And walked out, you know, and then got the part. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so then they fly me out to Chicago where, uh, where uh, they were filming. And um, I'm out there and they bring me in about a week early with all the other cast members to do rehearsals. And Hughes pulls me aside and he says, so here, here's the thing. He said, 
punk rock stuff, he said, it's, it's kind of on its way out. And as you guys, you know, anyone that knows John Hughes, man, he had his finger on the pulse of young people and whatever was happening or hip or cool or the latest fad or the thing, whatever, he knew what it was. And he said to me, he said, you know, punk rock is just kind of, it's just, it's just kind of a little gone. He said, and what I've noticed lately is there's this kind of bohemian deal that I've, I've seen and, and guys in like, tweed jackets with patch you know elbow patches but berets and just and you know yes. and and like tweed pants rolled up but with you know with high boots and just just kind of this funky bohemian artsy weird you know and uh and i and he goes i think we should do that i said sweet <laughs> bring it on <laughs> you know let's do it <laughs> and it was a blast i mean it was so fun it was so fun working with those guys and and John Hughes, because he was John Hughes, he just took all the time in the world. He shot so much footage and he'd always shoot the script first, but then he just loved to improvise. And so we would just keep doing scenes over and over and he'd have all this cool stuff. And like when we did the scene where I'm locked in the trunk of the car and, yes. and, and because Candy, you know, yeah, yeah. sees that I've been two timing his, his niece and, and, uh, and, and, and duct tapes my hands and duct tapes my mouth. And I'm in my t-shirt, I'm in the back of his car and he pops the lid open and I'm rah, rah, rah. most of that was, was improvised, you know, and then wow. he was just, just, just left. I mean, just a lot of it in, you know, and, and, um, and it was, it was, it was, I mean, it was just great. It, I mean, I could talk, I could talk for days about when, when he popped that trunk and he had the, the, the duct tape over my face, we're filming yes. in Skokie, Illinois, outside Chicago. It's the dead of winter, January. It was freezing cold and we're literally outside and I'm in the trunk of the car in a t-shirt, you know, so it's freezing and nobody thought what might happen when he reaches down and rips the tape off my mouth and let me the first take it i i'm convinced they used that take because it hurt so much and 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 i had a, a he had a thing stuffed in my mouth so he rips it off and i go ah! and i spit the wad at him and and i just start screaming at him and going off on him and 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 uh and I, I, like I said, I'm sure they used that take because it was real. <laughs> it was just like lit up. And afterwards, the, the makeup person comes, she's like, oh my gosh, I was watching the monitor. That looked like it hurt. Like, yeah, it really did. <laughs> yeah. Well, you wonder, you know, as, as a consumer of movies, as a watcher, you often wonder, you know, there are so many stories where you hear about like, a famous one being Indiana Jones. He's like, why don't I just shoot him? Yeah, that guy, exactly. In, you know, that wasn't in the script. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. One of yeah. my favorite movies um, called um, The Out of Towners, the original with um, Jack Lemon. Okay. There's a scene where the manhole cover blows, and apparently that was unscripted. Yeah. And they just said, hey, let's throw it in. So <laughs> it's great, great hearing about. You know, that must have, I, I, they probably tore off some of your lip. Man, it was close. After that, then they put, they put Vaseline all around my, my face and they just used the corners of the tape, you know, so it would hold on basically. And, and uh, yeah, and then I remember too, then as we continued that scene, so he brings me out, he drops me. And then, and then, uh, and then I start getting, then I'm like, Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Buck. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm please, just please let me go, you know? And, and then, uh, and then I start running off and I start screaming at him again, you know, and it was all improvised yeah. again. My dad's a lawyer and I'm going to sue you. And, blah, 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 blah. and I start running across the grass and just for effect, they would take a water hose. And if you ever watch a movie and they shoot any scene at night and it's like on a street, Nine times out of 10, they take a big fire hose and they wet the street down mm -hmm. because it reflects light and it just looks better, aesthetic. So what they did was they took this fire hose and they sprayed water in the trees and on the grass. So it, it froze instantly and it just made it look nice. The grass was frozen. And, and when, when I'm, I'm still tied up with my hands and I'm screaming at him and he goes, time for a little golf lesson. And then he yes. hits the golf ball, right? And, and of course, they just off camera had a little plastic golf ball that they bonked on my head. And then when I went down, though, man, I fell into the grass and it felt like 
shards just like needles you know just scrape <laughs> because it was frozen you know mm. on the t-shirt and it's it's literally you know 20 degrees outside and but you know what i mean again you go i'm working with john hughes and john candy man no kidding. praise the lord <laughs> <laughs> well now you you talked about going in for that interview for that with john hughes and john candy yep. all dressed up all garbed yep punk, punked up yep and you know you're talking about that duality on the in, on the outside you're you're a duck you're, yeah. you're you're a duck on a fast moving river your feet are moving like crazy inside yeah. going oh i can't believe this but you've got to be yeah how how important is it for an actor how important is that costume in helping you put on oh, the character? Yeah. I've got a story for you on that one. I mean, it, props and costumes, they can help immensely. So one of the jobs I got to do um, later in my career was I got to play Sonny Bono in the Sonny and Cher. Oh, Street yeah, on ABC. ABC. Yeah. Uh, and so literally, we took them from the 60s when they met and started through the 80s and and uh and they're they we bookended the movie with the their appearance on david letterman together when they sang i got you babe and they it was yes. kind of built as their reunion so we had literally 69 costume changes for the whole movie that had to go mostly from the 60s and 70s i don't think we did too much in the 80s except the david letterman thing that might have been early 90s i don't remember now but um so so here we have just these cool clothes. And of course, Sonny and Cher, that was part of their shtick, right? Was their wardrobe. And right. Sonny, they had these giant fuzzy boots that they used to wear back in the 60s, you know? And so we had giant fuzzy boots and just these cool clothes. So the one thing that Sonny had back in the 60s was he had this rabbit skin vest. And he wore it for several years. Yes. And it was kind of his, his, his thing that, you know, you recognized him by. And so they, they were looking and looking around and they were scouring all the wardrobe houses in town and they weren't finding anything that they wanted. They tried on several of these different vests. Nothing really worked. Finally, we're, we're shooting the scene in a bowling alley where we needed the vest. And so the wardrobe guy walks up to me and he goes, okay, put this on. He puts it on me. And he said, please whatever you do, if, if, if you're on a break or, or you go back to your trailer, he said, just make sure you come and, and give the vest to me because this is the vest. And I go, what do you mean this is the vest? He goes, there were three vests that Sonny had, and this is one of them. Mary Bono, let us use it. And sure enough, the vest, you open it up and he had actually, his signature was, was in the vest. So talk about wow. wardrobe. Now it, that's that's to the nth degree, Gordon, right? Where, where it's like, now I'm wearing Sonny Bono's vest. <laughs> like Sonny Bono, you know, and it's like, man, it doesn't get much cooler than that. Well, so, you know, we talk about, you know, the, the change in Hollywood and you talk about a character like, well, characters like Sonny and Cher. They had their, what was it called? The Sonny and Cher Comedy Hour yeah, or whatever. Yeah, that's it. Yep. variety shows were all all the rage yeah the map and Sonny Bono was the he played the fool yeah exactly but he was the driving force he was it's like it's like the Smothers Brothers Tommy who's the dumb one <laughs> in the but he was also their basic he was the brains yeah. of the operation and yeah. Sonny Bono I remember when he passed away Cher spoke uh to that point very eloquently yeah. about how you know what an, an, an in-depth character he was that was what is your favorite role that you've played oh gosh <laughs> uh, I, these ones that we've been talking about I, I certainly bug was a favorite playing Sonny was totally mm. a favorite. And then I would say probably the boy, the boy from the boy who could fly because mm. in that movie, I didn't speak. I had six words in the whole movie. Cause oh, yeah. he was an autistic kid. Yeah. And he just pretended to fly. That was a funky audition. What do you do for a character that does the main character, but doesn't have any words, you know, 
So and you were you were never typecasted either, were you? Because you were all over the place with your role. Yeah, Valerie exactly. Flake, uh, you know, dancing in September. The, dancing in September is proof that you would know what Hollywood is like because you were yeah. one of them. You yeah. were one of the. That's funny that you mentioned that, guys. Mark. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, Valerie, Valerie Flake too, where you were uh, mm -hmm. worked in a supermarket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the, I think what I saw in my career was. For the longest time at the beginning of my career, like I, I was saying, I often did play kind of like the all-American nice guy next door kind of kind of deal. And then, and then even with the boy who could fly, I saw too, I got a lot of parts where I played superhuman kind of kind of kid wow. characters because okay. I did the boy who could fly. And then um, I did the invisible kid, like you mentioned, yeah. that's kind of one we try to forget, but, uh, but, you know, and then there was, um, I, I did an episode of Superboy where I was the kryptonite kid yeah. and uh, oh, there was a couple others in there too. And, and I, and like I said, I, I, I kind of got these super. Was it young Indiana Jones, one of them or. No, that was, um, you know, who I played in that was, I played young Ernest Hemingway. Oh, wow. Three episodes. Yeah. Okay. Which, oh, that was a blast. I mean, that was that was a fun show because at the time they were filming most of the episodes in Europe. And okay. so they flew me to Italy to film this episode. And, uh, and then I shot two more back in the States and uh, yeah, that was, that was, that was just a blast. What was uh, it like to be the Lord protector? Now that one was a real low budget one okay. and another one that we just kind of forget about, you know uh, it had good intentions, I think. And, and it was kind of like a dungeons and dragon kind of a kind of style deal. And um, we had some neat actors and, and I really appreciated getting the job and working with the people that we did. It was one of those where it needed a lot of special effects and we didn't have quite the oh, money. Oh yeah, that makes sense. You know, that kind of deal. And that was kind of the thing with the, with the Fantastic Four too, which was, uh, that, that was, that's another favorite because of the story. So, so back in, um, it was like 92, 93, I get this audition for the Fantastic Four. My agent stoked because he's a big comic fan. I wasn't a big comic fan, you know, growing up. Um, I knew who the Fantastic Four were, but that I, I hadn't read much of the Fantastic Four, but he was stoked that I got this audition. Well, it turns out it's for Roger Corman, king of B movies, right? Um, yeah. For his version of the movie. And everybody's like, huh, what's up with this? So, so I get cast as Johnny Storm, the human torch, get my hair dyed blonde, the whole bit. And we start making this film. And for Roger Corman, it was actually a, it was a big budget for him. It was like 1.1 or $1.2 million. Roger does like 500,000 and under kind of things, you know? Yeah. And, um, and we knew that, okay, we've got a huge problem here because there's no way they're going to have the money for, for the effects that you need to have. But the director, Oli Sasson, he, he, he gathered us all together. And he said, gang, here's what we're working up against, the, the effects thing. So we know that the, they're going to be what they're going to be. So let's work hard at creating great characters, at staying true to the comic as best we can. Let's make the best movie we can. Because frankly, we all saw it as, as a possible calling card for all of us. It, this was potentially a career changer because it was going to, it was, if the comic world out there, you know, if they even kind of gave it a little thumbs up, you know, it, it, it could really, uh, it was going to be seen. I mean, yeah, they all knew the comic world knew we were making it. Um, and we finished the film from beginning to end. And then uh, it was supposed to premiere at the Mall of America in Minneapolis, and they had charity tie-ins with Ronald McDonald House. We we're all getting ready to go out there. Everybody's starting to get excited. We started doing comic conventions. Conventions were asking the cast to show up and, and do these comic conventions because everybody knew about it. And Oli calls us all up and says, it's gone. The movie's gone. The plug got pulled. We're like, what are you talking about? He goes, I don't know the story yet. All I know is it's gone. No premiere, no nothing. He's locked out of the editing room. It, it's so Oli, Oli was able to keep a, a, a transfer a copy for himself. And, and he made copies for all of us. And literally, this is back in 1993 or now it's 94. And because 
all of a sudden it's gone and everybody in the comic world already knew about it, people started asking the same question, what happened? So people started doing interviews with us and they started trying to do digging and put pieces of the puzzle together. And literally over almost the next 30 years, this continued to happen. And there was this crazy weird interest in it because it never came out. Mm -hmm. And then you started seeing bootleg copies show up at conventions and things. And we're still being invited to go to conventions. This is over, over a 25 year period. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. And, um, and finally, about, mm, I think it was like six years ago or so, um, somebody that was a, a part of the film, he was our casting director, and he worked for Roger Corman. He, uh, he said, you know what, we've got to make the final definitive last hurrah documentary about why this movie didn't come out. And we're going to put all these pieces together and try to lay it all out. And he did an amazing job. And we all participated. And, and he came out with this movie called Doomed aptly named for Dr. Doom and the fact that the movie was doomed from the beginning and come to find out that was exactly it. So the nutshell version is that at the time there was a German film producer named Bert Eichinger who had the rights to the Fantastic Four. Okay. Marvel didn't have the rights. And at the okay. time, early 90s, you had Superman's for DC and you had Batman come out with Michael Keaton, but, but Marvel comic movies were not a proven commodity. They, they weren't trusting yet that no matter what Marvel movie they made, it was going to be a big hit. And so there was apprehension about these because they knew they all had to have big budgets because they would need the effects. So Bert, Bert uh, his um, contract was going to expire on the rights by December 31st, I think of January uh, of, of 1992, unless he went into production. So he goes to Roger Corman and says, hey, can you make this movie? for a million dollars. Roger goes, sure, I can make that movie. He goes, make it. And so they, they, they got together the, this million dollars. And I think Bert thought, well, okay, if I have the finished product, I can still shop around the property and see if somebody else might want to buy it, like 20th Century Fox, for instance. Okay. Um, or, or if nobody wants it, I can still release it if I want to. So sure enough, we make the movie. He pulls the plug after we're done. He finishes the movie. And then sure enough, a few months later, they buy it. Um, he, he works out a deal with Marvel again. And then they all end up selling it to, um, to 20th Century Fox. Marvel is in on the deal also at this point. Okay. And Chris Columbus gets to make the first big budget version of the movie. And ours is never to see the light of day. And that's what we're trying to now do. It's like Oli, Oli had the greatest line. He said, you make a movie, you just want it to be seen, right? Yeah, you sure. just want it to be seen. And at first they were worried that this little two-bit Roger Corman version was going to detract from the other one. Now it's of such Hollywood lore that they should release it as a special on one of the other DVDs. You know, it's not going to hurt well, anything. Who knows? You know, we, we talk about Batman. Imagine if Adam West and Bruce Ward had, uh, if that show had never gone to air. It would still be, yeah. And when you look back at it, I cringe. I used to watch that as a kid Me all too. the time. Yeah. And I, I would take a blanket or something, tie it around my neck and yep. go flying around the room and drive my mom nuts. Totally. But And that's the way the Fantastic Four was. The version we made was much more, I always compare it to that. It was more campy, over the top, pow, blap, zap, you know, that kind of <laughs> stuff. You know, because... Because and the and you look at the effects now and you go, I mean, yeah, they're, they're laughable, but it's what we had for that time. But here's the cool thing. Right. We've actually gotten some great things from the comic world, too, that people have still said. A lot of people have said this, actually, out of all the three that they've already made, they they when they know about ours, they say that one is still the one that's most true to the comic. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it just has a, a, a feel of the original comic and then here's another funny one joseph culp robert culp's son joseph culp's an actor and he played dr doom and uh in our movie and he said he's got this great theory he calls it the the fantastic four curse because here's what's interesting for 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 uh for marvel is they've had some great successes with their properties right 
but what's the one property that just keeps sucking? It just keeps tanking their Fantastic Four franchise. It just has never done what it should do. And Joseph said, it's the curse. He said, my theory is that until they pay proper homage to the original and at least put us out on a DVD or something, they will never make a good Fantastic Four movie. <laughs> now, I'm not sure how that fits in with theology there, Gordon and Mark, but you know. <laughs> no, <laughs> doesn't fit in at all. And that's fine. Nope. <laughs> but I, I want to ask, is there a role that you turned down that you later saw someone blow up with and you went, oh, I should have taken that sure. role. Well, not that I should have taken. It's more, I don't think I was ever in that position where I turned something down. It was more the ones that I auditioned for, or maybe you got close on, you know, and you go, oh. Yeah, one that stands out in my mind is, oh man, I wanted this. Every young actor in my group wanted this movie at the time, The Dead Poet Society. Oh yeah, Robin, Robin Williams. Williams, wow. Man, I read that script and it just knocked your socks off, you know? Yes. And you go, okay, there's like six roles I could play. So come on, I got to get one of these. And it was kind of in my prime, you know? So I was really bummed. One actor that he, he and I competed for a lot of stuff and, uh, and he got some great breaks and, and he's a, I've never met him, but I, I just, I, I think he's a, a decent guy and that's uh, Sean Astin. So Sean oh, yeah. Astin and I always went up for a lot of the same stuff and he ended up getting some really, some really cool, cool parts that did great for his career, Rudy, you know, and then of course the, uh, the, um, the uh, Lord of the Rings stuff and, and whatnot, but uh, yeah, the, I don't think there was anything that I ever actually turned, <laughs> turned down. Yeah. <laughs> but but things that I auditioned for that I just didn't get that you go oh man that would have been sweet <laughs> <laughs> what was I it like you... doing Road to Redemption being a pastor that movie. so so at that one what was cool was I wasn't a pastor yet I was a believer hmm. and I was so excited when I went in for that audition again because here I got this script from my agent you know, just normal Hollywood, you know, get script from your agent kind of thing. And I'm reading it and I'm like, this is a Christian film, you know? And then, um, and then, um, oh, I'm still blanking on Billy Graham's uh, company that he had at the time that was okay. his film company. And I saw the, the name of the, the film company on the front. I went, huh. And I Googled it or, or maybe Google wasn't around at the time. I put it <laughs> online and saw that it was Billy Graham's. I'm like, oh man, I've, I've got to do this. I've got to do this. And the part wasn't a Christian part. In fact, it was the opposite. He was the guy that wasn't. Oh, yeah. And, um, and so uh, when I went into the uh, audition, um, I, I told the director, I said, man, I'm a believer. I said, I was so excited to get this script from you guys, you know, and I said, I just, you know, I, I just couldn't say enough and uh, hope it might work out. And I'd love to be a part of it. He cast me and, and it was the, the coolest thing was, is we, we shot it on location in, in uh, Utah, in Moab. And, uh, and the first day you get your call sheet, you know, which tells you what time you have to show up the next day and what scenes they're going to shoot. And down at the bottom, it said optional prayer time, a half hour before call. Wow. And I thought optional prayer time. I've never been involved with a Hollywood production where they're telling you that you can come to prayer. And I said to my wife, I said, I, I wasn't even supposed to be on that day. I said, I, I got to go down there and be there when they start. She goes, go, go. And so um the um oh uh new new no not new world worldwide worldwide pictures that's there it all so right. all the executives from worldwide pictures came out and um and they were there to kick it off as the very first day of shooting and sure enough every day after that and anyone wanted to was invited you didn't have to come and nobody was going to yeah. hold it against you if you didn't so we had a bunch of people from the crew and the cast and we stood there and prayed for the day's work, mm. gave glory to God. And I was just, I was just dumbfounded. I was just like, this is incredible. I mean, to be able to have that on a set, you know, and they treated everybody fairly. They treated everybody well. Even that was the word back from the crew who were not Christians. They got paid. They got paid on time. Sure. They didn't try to nickel and dime them. They didn't try to, you know, do underhanded kind of stuff. And it's like, Okay, so Hollywood doesn't have to be sleazy, you know. Was Julie Condra a believer? I don't know. 
Okay, because we I remember her would... most from uh, the Wonder Years. She was she was, was on the she? Wonder Years, young. Yeah, she was the one that Kevin had the hots for. And oh, was, yeah, that's that's cool that you that you got her name there. Um, I think she's a professing believer. I'm not really sure where she was at. Yeah. I don't think Pat Hingle was a believer, okay. but but he's the one that's basically the one that's the believer in the movie. Yeah, for you sure. know, telling her about knowing the Lord. <laughs> Mm. oh we had um Wes studi was in it you know he played geronimo in the geronimo movie you know yeah. uh native american actor he was great tony lago we had, we had a great great uh supporting cast on that too sure. i mean there's there's enough hollywood people too that they they truly they want to be involved in family friendly kinds of things. oh yeah you know you, you mentioned you know hallmark yeah. And having been involved with their productions, we had Viv Leacock on who's on there. He plays the pastor in When Calls the Heart. Oh, yeah, sure. 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 So. Love When Calls the Heart. Well, and here's what's interesting about Hallmark is I they're they're starting to go kind of south in some of the social areas. In fact, um, a friend of mine uh, represents uh, Candace Cameron Bure, oh, her yeah. Cameron's sister, who is like queen of Hallmark. And I, I had heard that she, I want to say, left Hallmark recently and went to a different group or was starting a different group just mm. because because they're starting to push the envelope with sure. things that they didn't want push before. So, What was it like working with Robin Lively? She was your uh, sister. She's a, she's a sweet gal. Um, and I, I'm trying to think if she still works in the industry. I know her sister, Blake, went on to become pretty well-known, Blake Lively. And uh, no, Robin was great. In fact, here's a fun story about Robin. So that was the Not Quite Human where I played the robot and she played my sister. Alan Thick invents me and she's my sister, Becky. And um, we had done parts one and then part two. And, uh, and somewhere after we had shot part two, Robin was graduating high school. And I was just a couple of years older than her, not, not maybe three years old or something like that. And so she, um, she, she wasn't dating anyone at the time and stuff and just wanted to go and have fun. Didn't want to have any weirdness, you know? And she goes, would you take me to my high school prom? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so I took her to her, uh, to her high school prom. We just had a blast, you know? Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. She was a sweetheart. And so was Alan thick. Just really enjoyed Alan too. And, uh, in fact, it's kind of strange. The um, he had when he had whatever I think it was a heart attack, right? That that uh that he had. It was on the ice hockey, and it was literally the ice rink is behind the church that I pastor right now in Burbank. It's oh, called the wow. uh, Pick okay. Rink. Um, they have an ice rink there, and that's that's where he uh where where he had this uh heart attack, I think it was, and and uh, had oh, passed. Wow. You know, these guys like he and Candy and and Hughes just too soon. You know, just too soon. Well, I want to come back around, uh, you know, talking about John MacArthur, mm -hmm. you know, a luminary in, you know, everyone knows, not everyone, but yeah. a lot of people know about John MacArthur. He garnered a lot of, you know, even people who aren't Christians who don't follow his broadcasts, his sermons, became aware of him during the, the past two years because yeah. of his stance on on co all things covid yep. he kept his church open yeah did you have any thoughts on his and how did you navigate uh the past two years so john decided to take a very very specific stance on on uh, the covid mandates and rules and and dealing with the local governments and 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 whatnot and and i think what we saw was every pastor and leadership team of of every church uh had to had to deal with that and come to uh what they thought was the right thing to do right and so in that respect i don't i wouldn't cast judgment on on anybody whether they stayed open like John and, and said, we find biblical reason to defy the authorities in this regard, or I wouldn't pass judgment on the people that said, no, we've got to not meet or, or we've got to do it, meaning by live stream or maybe find an outdoor situation that, that, would, uh, that would work. I, I think um, with John, it was interesting because Grace Church is a huge church. 
and they have lots yes. of resources. So when he decided to take that stand, they knew that they would have legal resources at their disposal to be able to fight, help fight the battle. Whereas a lot of other smaller churches aren't going to have those kinds of resources to, uh, to, to kind of uh, do what, what he did if you came to those conclusions, you know? So, so, so basically I was still up North at the time when it first started and yeah, our little 70 person mountain church, we had just started to experiment with live streaming things, you know? Um, okay. Because we had a, we had a person who was military and he'd have to go away for a month to do his reserve training stuff. And he's like, do you guys do online stuff? And we said, no, we haven't, but maybe we need to look into that. So we actually had started to look into it. And so boom, we just kind of kicked it up into high gear and we started live streaming stuff. And then when weather permitted, we'd move outside and did some outdoor stuff. When I came down here to Los Angeles to Calvary Bible, which was founded by John's dad, Jack, um, you know, they took a stance of, no, we'll, we'll, we're in Southern California and we can be outside. And so we'll, we'll do the outside thing and live stream it as well for other people. So yeah, I think everybody had to just kind of come to their own convictions, right? And their own conclusions. And I would not be the one to be the one to say, well, that was right, or that was wrong or that, you know, because it really was a, it really was a, just a conviction that each church body had, had to come to. Hadn't thought of that, but Southern California, having been down to San Diego, <laughs> talk about ideal conditions for outdoor yeah. worship. I mean, and, you literally could could do it year round if you if you needed to, you know, kind of thing. Whereas Weaverville, yeah, during the winter months, it, it you know <laughs> made it a little tougher. A lot of rain. <laughs> yeah, and and uh, up there we were well, in the mountains, so we had a little Jay, bit of snow and stuff. Pastor Jay, Jay, actor Jay, so <laughs> many different hats. Yeah. Okay, it's been an absolute thrill having you on the podcast. I, I hope you had a good time. I hope you had a great time. Chat. Yeah, we really enjoyed it. I mean, we grew up, you know, watching you on films and now we're love what you're doing right now. now you know? to you. Thanks, brother. And uh, I love the and I love the journey. I, I want just want you to end this off telling us, you know, what's 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 coming up next for Jay Underwood. What's, what's coming uh, up next? Well, what, it's only been it's only been in the last few particular church and and it's a larger church it's about 300 right now so it's that's that's bigger than the 70 that I had up in the mountains and uh and so it's just um it's kind of getting getting my footing we we uh I'm the only staff pastor right now and so we realized that we need to find uh find some extra help there and um and just uh i'm excited i'm excited for just whatever the lord has in store to uh to to keep us um keep us moving forward i want to you know we we want to we, we're right in the middle of burbank and we're in the entertainment capital of the world and so that's not lost on us you know and 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 we want to be able to to be a a light in certainly the darkness of hollywood and uh, and certainly reach our community Burbank and and that's that's something that's I think just kind of heavy on my heart is is I want us to just be a little more visible in Burbank I want the I want the town and community to know that we're there and that we've that we exist the church has been there for 70 years or whatever it is you know <clears throat> but um but I think there's more that we could do to reach our community and also to to reach Hollywood they 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 need the Lord too amen well, we really appreciate it. Thanks so much. And uh, if you like the podcast, uh, check it out. We're on all uh, audio platforms, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, video version is on YouTube. And we want to make it a point that we're not doing this for us. We're doing this to share Jay Underwood's journey, to share whoever we have on the podcast. So come along for the ride. It's going to be great. <laughs>